In this episode of Fictional Hangover, we talk about <laughs> wine and weed, the pest and the unleacher, and bedazzled breakaway blue jeans in our discussion of Out of the Dawn by PC Cast. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, welcome to Fictional Hangover, a podcast about young adult and new adult and sometimes other books, series, authors, voice actors, and illustrators that is full of spoilers. I'm Amanda. And I'm Claire. And today we're going to discuss Out of the Dawn by PC Cast. Standard disclaimer. If you haven't read this book, please remember that Fictional Hangover is all about spoilers. If you haven't read or listened and don't want to be spoiled, stop listening to us and go read or listen to the book. Then come back. If you haven't done this but want to pretend that you have, or if you don't care about spoilers, or if you just like the show so much that you don't care about any of that, then listen up. Yay. Yay. I also feel like we need to say, if you haven't read Into the Mist, go and read that first. Yeah. Or listen to our episode on Into the Mist. Uh, Both of those. Yeah, because, you know, part two of a duology, it's pretty important that you've got the first part under your belt. Yeah, you kind of need book one. Yeah. You kind of need book one for book two to make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> that That is part of background information, by the way, but I'm quite sure you've got more for me. You know, actually, no, I don't. Um, I was, really? Yeah, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't... I didn't go dig anything up. One, because, like, when you search for PC Cast interviews, it's, like, all of our episodes. So... <laughs> I'm, not, going to, I'm going to Google that right now. That's not very helpful. See. So... Um... Just go oh back. Oh my god, it is. <laughs> just go back and look at, you know, go back and watch all of our episodes with PC Cast because there's a million of them. She's got to be one of the more prolific authors that have been on. It's amazing. It's amazing how many times she's been on the show. I feel like she's just she's just one of those authors that like you see her name pop up on something. I'm like, "Okay, yeah, pre-ordered." Uh-huh. What is it? I don't care. Pre-ordered. <laughs> We have lists. We do. And she's she's pretty much on the top of that list for me. <laughs> oh, PC Cast is coming up with a new book this year. How many has she published this year? Oh, oh don't worry, I already bought it. Is that what's the title? Don't know. Already I don't know. I don't what's know. What's the release it? Don't know. Already pre ordered. <laughs> is it with Kirsten Cast? Don't know. Don't. Already pre ordered. Yeah. <laughs> Hardback, know. paperback, don't know, already pre-ordered. Yeah. Is there an audio book? Don't know, pre-ordered. Yes. But yes, there is, we've pre-ordered both. Yes, pre-ordered. <laughs> pre-ordered that as well. That's just how I, I am. Yeah. I've been very excited for this one as well. Me too. Very, very excited. Me too. Like, We love a duology too, and you know we don't get very many of those. No, so they usually fun. like 15,000 books in a series which is nice yeah if you can be consistently good throughout the series yes point so. and look at a certain vampire series it's okay you weren't all great <laughs> you know what we survived an entire year of suki we did i think we, we did. did and then so because there was there was 13 major books and we did a short story yeah we did we God, yeah God. yeah we did Toot everyone horn. Toot toot, we're good. Yeah, we are. Anyway, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about duology now. We're finishing up this lovely duology. Do you know what else I enjoyed about this book? My copy was hand-delivered. It was hand-delivered. I hand-delivered that to you in London. You did. And you can see our live episode where we're together, actually together, poking each other in the face because we (laughs) physically can, on YouTube... It's there. I will fictional ha- add fictional hangover on YouTube, or you can you know go to your favorite podcast dispatcher and listen yes. to us. Why listen to it? You can see us. Right. Do both. Do both. And speaking of live episodes, we have another one coming up yes. at the end of this month. Because of course we're doing a live episode on Halloween or for Spoopy Halloween because bug. it's our favorite thing to do. So, everyone, make sure you tune into that. Also on our YouTube on Sunday, October 29th, 2.30 p.m. Central Time, and that's 7.30 p.m. GMT. My time. 
it's going to be lots of fun because we've got some spooky friends joining us. Yes. You might want to have a look at the YA Horror Anthology at Tears of Darkness. Yes. Check out our social pages at Fiction Hangover on all of them. Yes, and you can see a fantastic video. We'll probably do more. Who knows? We might just keep playing the puppets over and over and over again, too. It's fine. I'm getting a prop delivered. I'm nervous. (laughs) It's fine. Okay. I think that we should go ahead and get started with this episode. In the small town of Mitchell, the green mist settles. Not too long ago... Mercury, Stella, and Ford were there, but Ford is dead, and the body in the green mist is happy about that. Alvin fucking Rutland lets the mist fill him up, and as he does, shadows and earth fill him too. A little bit later and a little bit farther away, Mercury wakes. She had been dreaming of Ford and asks her newfound dog, Khaleesi, if she heard him in the cave. Soon, Imani comes in and gets Mercury up and around. She informs her friend that she's sleeping too late. And yes, it's okay to not be a morning person. And it's also okay to do some depression sleeping, but it's the fucking apocalypse and everyone needs to keep their shit together. Or at least compartmentalized so they can survive. (laughs) Damn, Imani. Cop out mentalizing your shit. I love that. (laughs) Imani wants Mercury to go out with her into the painted hills so they can gather some colorful clay to build their adobe homes with. The world technically only ended like a week ago. But Imani means business. I mean, she is a boss lady. She really is. Yeah. While Mercury was depression sleeping, the rest of her group, Amani, Stella, Karen, Gemma and the kids, Georgie, Hayden, Caden, have been busy building fancier latrines, fishing in the river and making their new home in the caves livable while they prepare to build their adobe houses. Amani wants to travel to get colourful clay and also see if she can use their radio to contact Jenny and their friends they left behind at Timberline Resort. She, Mercury and Khaleesi hop into the truck, stopping to carefully cover their tracks and make their way to a scenic overlook where they find an RV. The couple inside are dead, but they had a gun, some canned food, a few bottles of water and some drums and a flute. Amani and Mercury take their supplies and then set up the radio. They are able to reach Jenny, tells them that they're having trouble with the green mist. They let her know that they've made it to where they will create their future home and give them very vague but accurate directions and tell the group to come out to meet them as soon as possible. Before they turn off the radio, another woman frantically calls out to them but almost refuses to tell them where she is located, which hmm, it gives both Mercury and Amani a very bad feeling. They head back home. Suspicious person is suspicious. So suspicious. Everyone is pleased that Mercury is no longer depression sleeping, and they make a plan to travel out to some nearby towns looking for a library and other supplies. Can I just say how happy I am? They're like, you know where we need to go? A library. I was, my heart filled filled with joy. Yes. (laughs) Always put a library on your apocalypse plan. Yeah, definitely. Mercury, Stella, Gemma, and Khaleesi will go on this trip. Stella, with her bad feelings foresight ability, thinks these are the only ones that need to go, even though Karen is good at reading maps. But she doesn't know if Gemma needs to go in order to use her healing abilities or not. She only knows that she needs to be there. The ladies drive on twisty side roads and pass a community in tents holding guns and looking angry, which they plan to avoid on the way back. Gun People Road is what they call it. They see a herd of goats that they think about trying to gather before they make it to the town with the library. They search the library for important information in books like how to make goat cheese, how to build windmills, how to make bricks and other stuff. But as they search, Khaleesi alerts them to someone else in the building. No. They find a man with a dog, but the man is injured. Stella's intuition lets her know that both the man, Marcus, and the dog, Badger, are safe and Gemma resorts over to help him and discovers that his leg 
is badly broken. It's gross. The bone's sticking through. It's a compound fracture. It's horrible. It's bad. Anywho, it's not infected, so that's all right. That's fine. She, phew, just that. <laughs> she heals him a little bit and then remembers him as the owner and cook at a cafe in town and they become fast friends. The group decides to let the man and his dog join them and plan to take them back to their safe haven where Gemma will learn how to set his broken leg. God. They gather a few more books, mostly medical ones, load Marcus up with some painkillers and head back with Mercury and Khaleesi in Marcus's jeep and everyone else in the truck. Stella, she has a bad feeling that they need to get moving. Or actually, they needed to like get a move on a little while ago. Uh-oh. They drive a little bit, dodging the green mist and bodies when they come upon them. Gross. But soon, Gemma sees a young man shambling around in the wilderness alone. She demands they stop to help him, but Khaleesi, Stella, and Mercury have a bad feeling about him. (sighs) Gemma, Gemma lets me down a little bit here. She acts like a petulant teenager for entirely too long, starting now. But they stop and learn that the guy, whose name is Chad, which is another fantastic douchebag name. Like, how does she come up with so many good douchebag names? Anyway, Chad has been bitten by a rattlesnake. Good. That's it. Good. <laughs> Don't Sorry. leave him to die. <laughs> um, this cough, man. It's this cough. So the rattlesnake bite is a tough wound to heal especially without anti-venom, but Gemma is certain she can help him survive. Stella and Mercury want to heal him enough so he can care for himself and leave him behind, which is the correct thing to do, but Gemma insists on taking taking him back to their home. Stella's intuition is telling her that this isn't a good idea and that Chad is the reason why they should have left the library sooner, but... She doesn't really know why he's bad, so she allows him to come along. As they drive through small towns, Mercury notices a dead woman on the side of the road with plants growing from her abdomen like some sort of alien monster, and it's terrifying. Let's see the goats again and think about a way to gather them, but they can't do it now, so they continue on to their home. Chad thinks it's pathetic that they are camping and not taking over an abandoned town but no one but Gemma really cares about what Chad has to say <laughs> shut up Chad shut up Chad ugh Chad ugh, ugh Chad everyone warms to Marcus and Badger pretty much immediately because he just sounds like the cuddliest of teddy bears oh, yes. and again no one really cares about Chad Though, as former teachers, Mercury, Stella, Karen and Amani try to give him a chance. As they sit down together to eat, Marcus asks if Chad is related to a woman he knew and discovers that he is her grandson. The women think it is curious that Chad abandoned his grandmother and so does Marcus, especially when he learned that she could grow plants with her blood. But she died when marauders came through, which, when Marcus describes them, the women recognise as the group from Madras. Oh my god, Damn. not the Madras group. They're the worst. Everyone is safe now, though, and they all enjoy dinner and took the injured men into rest. Imani takes her usual evening walk to the cedar tree, and when she returns, she has dire news. The destroyer she mentioned just a few days ago at the end of the first book is coming. She can sense that he's of the earth and not actually a man, but that he's angry and out for revenge. She tells her friends that they must move their camp up to the top of the cliff and begin working on their adobe brick homes immediately. Imani mentions that there's a small pool of water fed by a small waterfall and a bit of space up there to do their planting. So everything will be fine. She does wish that it was, you know, just a little bit bigger or a little bit better. The teachers do what teachers do best and plan exactly what they need to do to prepare for their move. Then they all finally decide to go to sleep. No, they don't. They have wine and marijuana and they then go to sleep. They smoke so much weed and drink so much wine. 
<laughs> Every time we mention them going to sleep, it there's always weed and wine beforehand also every time we mention them eating or gathering together or doing anything anything together in the campsite weed wine yeah we'll just it's put amazing. that in there now it's yeah. amazing just know that that happens just every single know it's time there. it's always there <laughs> well mercury dreams of ford but he asks her if she's really dreaming or if he's actually there hmm then he says he will come to her when she is really ready but that time has not yet arrived yay cryptic dreams <laughs> she reaches are they hand. dreams or are they dreams <gasps> well she has had a lot of weed and wine i know who knows what the fuck is going on <laughs> well she reaches behind her to touch his leg and realizes that it is covered in fur then looks over and sees a cloven hoof print. Ooh. What? <laughs> Say what? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, elsewhere, Eva and some of her goons from Madras are out scavenging. Alvin fucking Rutland spots her and is aroused by her and we all vomit a little bit in our mouths. When she leaves her group of goons to pee, he approaches her and offers to take her into the mist to help her develop powers like his. And then he shows off his ability. Oh. Leeches attached to his body oh. slither off oh. and kill oh. a rabbit. Oh. Oh. Eva is intrigued. Rose. Sick bitch. The next day, Gemma asks for Mercury's help in setting Marcus's leg. They get him all hopped up on painkillers and weed, which Chad whines about wanting more himself, and everyone tells him no. And then, on the count of three, aka on the count of two, Mercury yanks. The bone resets, and Marcus passes out. Gemma uses her magic to heal him while he's unconscious, which works very well. He's... Very nearly perfectly fine when he wakes up. Chad is interested in how Gemma can heal, but the only answer he gets is, it's the green mist. Shut up, Chad. (laughs) Shut up, Chad. (laughs) Fuck you, Chad. Later, they start carrying their supplies up to the clifftop, and Chad doubts that Mercury is strong enough to do some heavy lifting. Shut up, Chad. Fuck you, Chad. Chad. And while she wants... To toss him over the edge. Do it, do it. She restrains herself and again no. explains that they got their powers from the mist. You think he would have picked up on that by now? But he's an idiot. Shit As they shot. work, surprisingly, Caden and Hayden finally speak because, <gasps> if you will recall, they did not say one word throughout the entirety of the first book. So they finally speak, and they tell Mercury she's their warrior. Yes. Yes, she is. Oh, yeah. Then they ask if they'll be safe on the clifftop. Yes. Yes, they will. (laughs) When they reach the top, Mercury is very impressed, as it's the first time she's been up there. But Amani and Stella flip out. Remember how Amani wished everything would be bigger? It seems that the Earth listened. The small pool is huge and filled with crystal clear water. And the planting space is, well, it's amazing. It's just amazing. They all stop to wonder how that happened. I mean, wow. But then they think of all the wonderful things they can do now and understand it's magic. It's magic. And they are very thankful for it. They immediately get to work making their adobe bricks and building their sanctuary in the sky. Al wakes Eva early the next day and takes her to a river of green mist, ready to help her evolve. She tells him that the green mist did nothing for her. It only made her blood toxic to plants. But he suggests she needs to be exposed again all the time thinking of how he's going to use her and control her and take over Madras. And then... the world. (laughs) Fuck that guy. That's just not. Just don't. No, no. When Eva comes to after taking in the mist, she coughs and finds a living swarm of mosquitoes 
inside her body. Nah, dog. Nah. She can also hear and see and smell much better than before. She hears a nest of squirrels and commands her swarm to devour them, then launches them at Al. (laughs) She calls them off and then sexily approaches him. He decides he's going to have her, but not right now. Now he needs to go off and leave a present for his teacher friends. Ugh. 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 Mercury, Imani, and Stella decide to make a run to Mitchell for more supplies. The large group from Timberline will be there soon, and they worry that they won't have enough food for them until their gardens start to grow. Gemma wants to go with Chad, fuck you, Chad, Chad. to gather more colourful clay for their bricks, while Karen and Marcus stay back with the children. But, you know, she's being irritatingly petulant about Mm. it, which makes the women very uncomfortable. Mm. Marcus offers to go with them as chaperone, and everyone is sorted after that. Chad is being a dick the whole time, of course, because it's Chad. Shut Chad. Chad. Fuck you, Chad. When the women arrive in Mitchell, Imani is ecstatic to find a raw wood furniture store and the lumber they find there that will help with making all the bricks. How lucky are they? Magic. It's magic. There are also rocking chairs that they drool over and decide to return for later. They stop by the grocery store, the feed store, and another shop and gather lots more supplies, including surplus containers of salt, olive oil, rice, and other basic staples, ropes, and animal feed, too, and a beautiful ballerina skirt that they bring home for Karen, and it's so sweet and so beautiful. They also find three inflatable rafts and life jackets, which they will grab when they come back for the rocking chairs. As they're about to leave for home, Imani hears a kitten yowling and rushes to find it, but it's near the green mist and covered with leeches. Oh. <gasps> Imani rescues the kitten, and it becomes her new companion, and it's amazing, <laughs> and it's precious. But then she's swallowed up by the mist. This is Imani's second dose, and luckily she's okay afterward. Meanwhile, Al fucking Rutland winces with pain when his leech companions are killed. When he sees through their eyes, he notices it's the teachers that destroyed his leeches and knows they'll be going back to Mitchell again soon. Ugh. Creep. After a long afternoon of carting supplies up to the cliff top, Mercury is sweaty and smelly as and decides to bathe in the creek before eating a fantastic dinner of fish, rice and beans and greens prepared by Marcus. After Mercury is clean, she rests under a tree, exhausted, and falls asleep after smiling up at a beautiful eagle. She thinks she wakes when Ford snuggles in behind her, but he's dead? Surely it's just a dream. As they're about to dream kiss, because, what the hell, why not, Stella calls for her. Mercury scrambles up and sees a man with furry legs, horns, and hooves bounding away. It's Ford. It's Ford. He must be alive, just changed. Damn. (laughs) After dinner, everyone gathers while Gemma reads to the children. Chad thinks it's stupid shut up chat and Gemma seems annoyed by him which makes all the adults so happy oh my goodness. maybe he'll grow up a little and stop being such a dick and maybe Gemma will be more her mature self instead of a starry eyed teenager <sighs> we all wish that that were true Marcus well, takes she's only Stella 16, bless her. yeah but they say so many times she's so much older than that on the inside and normally That's she true. is that is true she's the one that talks a lot of sense <sighs> Marcus takes Stella on a romantic stroll which is swoony and Imani goes for her walk to the cedar tree Mercury and Karen sit by the fire and Karen asks if when they decide to plant their garden Mercury will lead them in a ritual Coming from super Christian Karen, this is amazing. 
She explains that she's learned from her new world that it's okay that she keeps Jesus alive in it as long as she doesn't tear anyone else down. And we all wish that everyone in the world would listen to Karen. That's a very sensible, sensible Karen. Mercury then asks Karen to pray and dance at the ritual, which fills her with joy. And she goes to bed, which means she smokes a lot of weed and drinks a lot of wine. (laughs) (laughs) Soon after Karen leaves, Amani returns from the cedar tree and blurts out to Mercury that she can feel the tree breathing and that it wants to tell her something. But before that could happen, because, you know, honestly, we relate, she panicked and left. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) She noped out of there. Yeah, well, I mean, wouldn't you? So that you can feel a tree breathing. Yeah, nope. Mm -mm. Give give me five minutes to adjust. Mercury tells Amani that's nothing to be afraid of and that she could feel the essence of an elm tree outside her condo. She explains about her pagan beliefs and that everything has power, even rocks and trees and streams. Amani plans on reaching out to who they lovingly call Grandma Cedar again. Eva makes a big announcement in Madras that night. She tells all the women that they will be moved into snug houses right next to the park where they've created their garden area because her very important doctors have discovered that their blood makes plants grow. But don't worry, it's not like they're going to be taken out and bled. Oh no, nothing like that. Um, yes, it's going to be exactly like that. For reference, please see Into the Mist. Can you see fertilizer? (laughs) Everyone in town is completely fine with what they've just been told, except for one woman, Martina, who Eva immediately plans to kill. But she's able to escape instead. Way to go, Martina. (laughs) It's shocking how brainwashed everyone is and that they're all completely fine with being told where to live and what to do. I think Eva wears a red baseball cap. I think Eva is a testicle in an ugly hat. She she is. She really is. (laughs) Al is impressed with Eva's ability to manipulate the townsfolk, but he knows his manipulation skills are better. Does he know? He's still waiting for the opportune time to take over Eva and Madras and the world. Prick! (laughs) A few days later, Mercury wakes up, super sore from carrying supplies up to the top of the cliff and preparing the garden for planting, which they'll do later in the evening after she leads them in a ritual. She's decided to keep it very simple and wants Stella to paint on every one with colourful clay, so when she wakes, they plan to gather some more rich colours from the painted hills overlook. While they're up there, Stella wants to contact the Timberline group to see where they are on their journey. As they drive, they talk about Marcus and how much Stella scarily likes him and then Mercury blurts out about seeing Ford, which is one of my favourite parts in the book. Yeah, I agree. And also thinking, he's alive! And also part really hairy and horned and cloven. Perfectly normal. Stella believes her friend, got no reason not to, and tells her to tell Ford she's ready to accept him horns and hooves. They are able to get in touch with the Timberland group who are only one day away but as they talk the same woman from before cuts in again asking for help and again they ignore her which Stella knows in her gut is the right thing to do and you can tell she's a sussy sus person because you know it's obvious. She's just made of sus. She's just made of sus. Later Stella paints everyone with dots and moons and swirls and stripes and bright, beautiful colors. Everyone but Chad, of course. Fuck you, Chad. Shocking no one. Fuck you, Chad. The ritual is brief and simple, but fulfilling to everyone, again, except for Chad. (laughs) Though he does follow Gemma with his gaze as she dances to the music played by Hayden, Caden, and Georgie. Mercury calls the elements, and Karen leads them in a prayer and dances wearing her ballerina skirt as a beautiful eagle soars overhead. And really, the entire thing is just lovely. I don't, there's not another word for it. It's just lovely. It's precious. 
The women finish their ritual by slashing their palms and adding blood to the water as they plant. Then they all rinse off their clay, eat dinner, drink a lot of wine, smoke a lot of weed, and return to their campsite below to go to sleep and smoke a lot of weed and drink a lot of wine. Minus Stella and Marcus. Wink. Unfortunately, also minus Chad and Gemma. Please, everyone, tune back in for a second. You might have, you know, gazed off longingly in the distance listening to us tell you this story, but please skip the next paragraph if you need to. Uh, There will be a marker for you in your podcast player if your podcast player allows for that. But know that there are no details about what is to come provided in our summary. Later, Gemma wakes Amani crying. She's been sexually assaulted by Chad. But now that she's made it to Amani, Mercury and Karen, she knows she's safe. Amani and Karen get her cleaned up while Mercury goes off in search of him. Gemma told the ladies that Chad had been secretly gathering with supplies and was going to steal Marcus's jeep and together he and Gemma would run away together. Mercury is putting a stop to that plan right now. She finds Chad who tells her Gemma was asking for it for what he did to her by dancing during the ritual. (laughs) No. She knocks him out and ties him to a tree at the top of the cliff. The next morning, Mercury confers with Amani, Karen and Stella, and Marcus and Gemma too, and then throws Chad off the cliff to his death. The spiky, spiky rocks of death. Rape is not allowed in their new world, and everyone who matters agrees. Not long after this, the group from Timberline arrives. There are more than 20 of them, mostly women, including Doc Hillary and Jenny, and four men. Mercury immediately explains about Chad and the rules that they have made for their new world. Basically, they boil down to one important one. Be compassionate and kind to one another, aka don't be a garbage person. But Mercury, Stella, Imani, and Karen will ultimately decide what is right if disagreements arise. Mercury gives the group until the morning to decide if they will stay or go and offers them provisions if they want to leave and a recommendation to avoid Madras. And then they all unpack and enjoy a nice dinner and much needed rest and lots of weed and wine. Only one man (laughs) decides to leave the next day. So they set him up with some necessities and he departs. Necessities do not include wine and weed. No. Nope. He's not worthy of that. That's people who stay Mercury, Stella, Amani, Karen and Gemma chat with Doc Hillary and Jenny and learn that all, not all the Timberline women have been exposed to the mist and there are a few who were but their blood cannot make plants grow though. Like Karen, they are enhanced in other ways. Karen admits that she can see the spirit world and Jenny says that plants grow really well for her and says another woman is a fantastic baker. Another is an excellent seamstress and another is a potter. Doc Hillary can heal somewhat like Gemma, though she's better at healing the mind, which is very important. They also discuss the LGBTQIA community, and Stella's gut confirms that the mist enhances people spiritually and magically, not biologically, which is, frankly, amazingly remarkable. (sighs) Meanwhile fucking Al Rutland decides he's going to go back to Mitchell to wait out the teachers and Eva thinks he's obsessed which he he definitely is yeah he is she has plans to scavenge small towns and he has plans to scavenge teachers so they'll meet back up later after everyone is settled Mercury and Stella decide to take a trip back into Mitchell to grab the rocking chairs and rafts Gemma wants to come too, but she's healed Marcus's leg completely, plus two of the people from Timberline, so the adults decide she needs to stay back and rest. Georgie comes up and wants to go too, so Mercury and Stella promise a girl's trip the next time they go. Georgie is placated. Gemma is not. Gemma decides she's going to sneak off and start feeding the goats so they'll be able to gather them another time and bring them home and takes Georgie with her. They lie to Karen about going to gather more clay and drive off in a utility vehicle the group from Timberline brought. They find the goats and start feeding them, but then Eva and her cronies drive up. They try to take the girls with them back to Madras, but they both know better, 
so they run. Unfortunately, Georgia gets kidnapped, and Gemma gets knocked off the edge of a ravine and is left for dead. Gemma's having Gemma's a capital A, capital D at day. Fuck. Honestly, she just needs she needs a duvet day. She does. She needs a duvet day. Well, in Mitchell, Stella and Mercury gather their supplies, plus more wine because they definitely <laughs> need it, and plan to return later for even more good stuff. But then Stella has a bad feeling and tells Mercury they need to leave fast. As they're driving away from Mitchell, Al fucking Rutland shows up, because of course he does, and chases them down one of Eva's SUVs, which is much newer and faster than Stella and Mercury's old truck. But they don't realise who it is that is after them. Just as he's gaining on them, Mercury spots a satellite man rush into the side of the SUV, knocking it over, then running off and turning into an eagle. Wow. <laughs> wow. She knows it's what? Ford and that he's just saved their lives. But seriously, what the fuck? <laughs> what? Stella suggests that Mercury meet with Ford and invite him to finally reveal himself. Stella knows with her intuition that everyone in their group will accept him, just not immediately. They get back to their home to find everyone freaking the fuck out, looking for Gemma and Georgie, so they join in the search. Eva and Al meet back up, Eva with Georgie, and Al with a busted-up SUV. They both explain what they did while they were apart, and Al also includes his murder-by-teacher and resurrection story. He has a brilliant idea to take Georgie back to where they found her and let her go, so she'll run back to their camp and Al can follow behind later to finally exact revenge on his precious teacher. In the meantime, Mercury remembers talking to Gemma about the goats, and Stella knows that's where they'll find her. So they, plus Imani, head out there. And sure enough, they find Gemma in Ford's arms. He explains that she's badly injured and that he couldn't track Georgie because she was taken away in a vehicle. He tells the women that though Gemma is injured with a serious head wound, their other doctor will be able to save her. They rush off to Doc Hillary, but before they leave, Ford asks Mercury to meet with him later. Oh. Oh. Doc Hillary isn't so sure that she can save Gemma, even though she has a strong mental healing ability. When Stella tells Doc Hillary that she knows she can save her, the doctor realizes, yeah, she can. If she has another dose of the green mist. They work together to find some mist in a creek, and Hillary holds Gemma as it washes around them. This is only the second exposure for Hillary, but it's the third for Gemma. Oh. As we all know, she will be okay, thankfully. <sighs> Hillary focuses on asking the mist to wash away Gemma's wounds, and it works. And Hillary's okay too, thank goodness. As they're heading back to their camp, Gemma tells Mercury that she thinks she's delirious because Ford saved her. And he has horns and hooves now. <laughs> Mercury assures Gemma that she's perfectly fine. She's fine. She's fine. She's fine. She's fine. When they get back to camp, not long after, Imani and one of the Timberline women drive up. They've found Georgie. Yay. Georgie's worried that Gemma is dead, but no, everyone's fine. She also mentions Ford and his fariness. And is also okay with it, just like Gemma, and just like everyone else will be. Eventually. Georgie tells them about being with Eva and Al fucking Rutland, which, um, excuse me, what? He's alive? Because nobody knows that. Except for us, you know, because we're reading yeah. the story. We're having a pee story. Yes, unfortunately, he is alive. And Ford told Imani that he was following Georgie, but that he would do his best to distract him so they could all get back to their camp safely. Georgie said, Al isn't furry like Ford is, and then he looked like a normal guy, which is interesting considering the last time they saw him, he was disgusting and, you know, also full of bullets. <laughs> <laughs> Why is he back? And how? 
Imani answers that one. He's the destroyer. No, it doesn't. Ah, uh, shit. Speaking of, Al is pissed, and no. so are his leeches. He's not surprised that Ford survived, since he did, and he's pleased when he realizes that when he kills Ford, and he will, the teachers and the rest of the women will crumple without him because they're just that pathetic. My God, what an absolute fucking loser he is. Oh my God. It's it's sad, really. Oh, you can't survive because you're just little women and you need a man. Fuck off. Mercury meets with Ford later that night, and while she's a little nervous, she knows Ford and isn't afraid of him. They talk about how and why he came back, and the same about Al fucking Rutland. Ford explains he is the personification of the green man, the protector of the earth, and Al is his balance, the exact opposite. Ford and Mercury and all their friends choose good, while Al and Eva choose evil. They know that Al is coming for them soon, so they will move everyone up to the cliff top. But Ford promises to keep Al away as long as he can. They kiss then, but don't do anything else. Though Mercury kind of wants to, but she also kind of needs more time to. Because, good heart. Ford is a perfect, if very gentleman, and respects her decision. <laughs> The next day, everyone begins moving everything up to the clifftop, and Imani starts building the adobe houses while Ford flies around keeping watch in his eagle form. It's exhausting work, but it all has to be done. As night draws in, Mercury, Stella, Gemma, Karen, and Janet, a Timberline transfer, and probably Karen's new BFF if we're being totally honest, rest in the original camp and not up top. Before Mercury goes to see Ford, she checks on Gemma's recovery from her near-death experience and her third missed exposure. She's feeling fine and realized she can do something new, which is pretty amazing. Her blood now has the power to return dead plants to life. And we kind of wonder... On behalf of all of the teachers and all of the grown-ups, if this would work on a coffee bean. Oh, God, I hope so. (laughs) Anyway, she wants to test it on a person the next time someone gets hurt. But, you know, nobody wants anybody to get hurt. Mercury leaves the group then to go see Ford, who tells her not to worry about Al fucking Rutland for that moment because he's not coming yet. And when he does, he will keep her safe. They spend the night enjoying each other's company. Wink. Unfortunately, Ford accidentally showed Al where they were by flying around the area in his eagle form, and then he tracked them to their exact location. Damn it. Damn it! He takes a few of Eva's goons to attack. Mercury wakes the next morning, enjoys some coffee and breakfast with her friends, and then Ford rushes up to alert her that Al and his goons with guns are only a few minutes away. There's no way everyone can get up the cliff top quickly enough, but Stella, Amani, Georgie, Hayden and Caden rush up. They take Khaleesi and Dandy the kitten, while Mercury, Gemma, Karen and Janet go to the river and use the rafts. Ford pops two of the rafts and starts loading everyone in when when Stella, Amani and the children, plus the animals, join them. They're unable to take the path up to the cliff top because there's mist. Oh, damn it. Everyone piles into the raft, minus Stella, Mercury and Amani, who wear life jackets and float alongside it. Ford pushes them into the river and uses his powers to keep the mist at bay. But then Al and his cronies start shooting at them, and Gemma and several of the people who are at the top of the cliff shoot back. It's a harrowing journey that scares Imani's kitten who jumps into the river. Imani goes after it and saves it, but gets drawn into the mist again. Ford transforms into a giant salmon and pushes Imani through the mist, and back to the raft. He swims away and transforms back into his eagle form. He uses his immense wings to waft the green mist at Al and his men, who are dodging bullets that are still coming from the top of the cliff. Al is able to get away, but the men are not. 
But the only way he's able to escape is by shooting Ford in the wing. Ooh. Al leaves the puddles of Eva's goons behind, but instead of returning to Madras and Eva, he goes to collect his scraggly men that he had with him in book one. Ugh. Ugh, unwashed. Ugh. Gemma uses her new bleed-on powers on Ford's arm after he transforms out of eagle form, and it works! Then the group begins their walk back to their home. They arrive in the evening and Ford is welcomed warmly by everyone. Doc Hillary and Jenny were able to move most of the rest of the important supplies up to the cliff top, so they all head up there to safety. Stella's intuition tells her that Al won't be back for a couple of days, so they eat and rest and celebrate their survival with wine and weed. <laughs> Emani leaves the group to go to her tree like she always does, and when she returns, she has something to share. Her third exposure to the mist has given her a greater ability to connect with nature, and she tells the others that Grandmother Cedar took her in like her consciousness was inside the tree, which is pretty amazing. She learns things, but hasn't quite processed everything just yet. Karen chimes in and shares that her ability to connect with spirits. She knows that the Earth is happy with them and how they're handling the apocalypse, which is a very good thing. Yeah, it is. Phew. <laughs> it's nice to have that thumbs up. Al and his scraggly men yeah. get to Madras. <laughs> It was curious as to why Al's precious teachers aren't with him, but he explains everything that happened and why he brought the men that he has with him now. They plan on attacking the teachers and their clifftop very soon and want to bring Mercury and Ford back alive, but they don't really care about anyone else. Stella and Mercury know about the impending attack, so they prepare everyone on the cliff. They begin creating barricades and move boulders to the edge of the cliff so they can hide behind them and shoot. Mercury notices that Imani is not looking so good and plans to talk to her later, and also suggests that they keep making adobe bricks. Stella confirms all this to be a good plan and lets everyone know that they should be safe because there's only one path up to their settlement. The attack happens at dawn the next day. Al and Eva bring around 50 men with them, and they pretty much have all the weapons. Mercury, Stella, Marcus, Amani, and Ford stay at the cliff edge to face them, while everyone else shelters behind them. Al shouts up with a bullhorn for them to surrender, and Mercury shouts down with her super strength voice that they won't. I wish she'd just told him to go fuck himself. I know, my God. Then one of Al's goons shoots up at them with a grenade launcher. Well, shit, that's not going to be good. Nope. The group makes a plan to attack, but Amani stops them with a better, but frankly more terrifying idea. It's cool, though. It's very cool. Very cool. <laughs> the Earth has told Imani that the only way they will win this war is if they throw down all their weapons which they do al thinks they're surrendering but of course they're not imani mercury stella karen and Gemma gather buckets with water from their pool and knives and move to the edge everyone else stands behind them hands held and they all begin to chant the air the fire the water the earth awake 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 while the twin boys play the drums the women slice their wrists and plunge them into their water buckets, claim their gifts from the earth, Mercury, her warrior gifts, Stella, her sight, Imani, the mystic, Gemma, her healing, and Karen, her spirit, then pour the water off the edge of the cliff. As the men below begin to shoot at them, thorny vines burst from the ground and impale them, and the mist swoops in and washes over any men who try to run away. Yay! It's amazing! Though all the men are dead, Al and Eva refuse to give up. Eva unhinges her jaw and lets loose a huge cloud of mosquitoes that swarm to her and carry her up to the top of the cliff, while Al and his leeches slither up the side. Oh. Whoa. Eva's swarm begins to attack everyone, but Stella tells Mercury to go to their garden and gather up all their citronella, lavender, and marigolds. 
Mercury returns and opens her wound, spilling blood on the insect repellent plants. She tackles Eva, drops the bloody plants on her, and commands them to grow. The plants kill the swarm and drags Eva's lifeless body underground. Al, meanwhile, has slithered up the side and has unleashed his leeches on he's, them. He's unleashed his leeches, is what I oh. meant by that. I'm just, I'm just going to get rid of that. You should read that sentence over again. Unleashed sorry, not his sorry. leashes. You are not sorry for that. Don't I'm even not. pretend. I'm leaving it in. And Marnie runs off while her friends are attacked, but she returns shortly with a giant bag of salt. <laughs> she commands Ford hold Al down and Mercury hold his mouth open, which they do, all the while being attacked. Amani then pours the salt into Al's maw, killing him and all his leeches. When he dies, it begins to rain, and everyone who was attacked by Al is healed. The next morning, the Core Four, Mercury, Stella, Imani, and Karen, take in their new world and thank Grandmother Cedar and the Earth for caring for them. They promise to protect their new world and do better than mankind that came before them. Then, they move over to study the wall of thorns that surrounds them. Imani tests a theory that she has, that anyone who means no harm will be able to pass safely through the barrier. And she's right, which is good, because Martina, the woman who escaped from Madras, arrives then. She tells the women that she was somehow drawn to them, and they invite her to walk through the thorns and join them. She and her horse walk right through, and Karen takes them off to show them around. The rest of the women believe that more people will be drawn to them, and they will let them in. More bad guys will come, but they know that they will forever be safe as long as they live together in love and laughter and light. (gasps) And wine and weed. And wine and weed. (laughs) Love and laughter and light and wine and weed. <laughs> Love it. Love it. So yes. good. Everyone, enjoy some love and laughter and light and wine and weed. As long as it's legal in your country slash state. Yes. And you are of legal age. Yes. Because this is not the apocalypse, I'm sorry to tell you. But you can only do it for like 30 seconds or so, however long this promo is. Oh, you've got, a, you've got a hustle. Have you ever wondered what Tina Fey has in common with Jonathan Swift? Or how Star Wars is connected to feudal Japan? Or just how pervasive Shakespeare's influence still is? I'm Rhonda. And I'm Erin. And our show Pop DNA explores the literary and historical roots of your favorite pop culture works. Like the Greek mythology and early 20th century feminism echoed in the film Wonder Woman. Or the classic dystopian fiction and real-life political revolutions that informed the Hunger Games. Every month, we bring you a deep-dive discussion of a selected pop culture work. Featuring jokes no one will think are funny and literary references no one asked for. Find us at thepopdna.blog or anywhere you get your podcasts. By the way, Shakespeare is bigger than Disney. The duology has come to an end, Amanda. Oh, I no. know. Oh, oh yes. Oh, it was a I very love it. satisfying ending. So good. <laughs> there were so so many satisfying things that happened in this book. Yes. Yes. Number one, throwing Chad off the cliff. Oh, fuck you, Chad. Shut up, Chad. Don't be Shut like Chad. you, Chad. Shut up, Chad. As soon as we knew his name was Chad, I was like, oh, God. Yep, yep. And Lorelai King, the audiobook narrator, she she had a Chad voice down. Oh, it was was horrible, wasn't it? I mean, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Oh, yeah, But every time he spoke, you're like, shut up, Chad. Shut up, Chad. Shut up, Chad. No one cares about you. No one cares about you what can, you, you can, say. You can, you can see his face when he's like, Ugh, Ugh. Uh, you guys are dumb. Uh, mm. You're just all women doing this. No, we're not all women. Ugh. 
Shut up. Look, you're like healthy looking and stuff, but I don't think you can carry anything up to the top of the cliff. Oh, yeah, you know what I can carry up to the top of the cliff and then throw it right back off the other side? You. <laughs> stupid fucker. Absolute stupid dick. <laughs> I was... <laughs> As as happens, you know, talk about books that we're reading with spouse. I'm sure you do the same thing. And I was explaining the Chad character and how as soon as you knew, as soon as he came on, you're like, not nah, bad news. And then when you found out his name was Chad, you're like, oh my God. <laughs> but then I said, <laughs> which this made him chuckle. And I hope it makes you chuckle at least a little bit. I think they describe the, the, the rocks on which they live on in the mountain cliff top and how there's these sharp rocks and it's mentioned a few times and then when he finally gets thrown off the cliff and he lands on the sharp rocks I was like it was Chekhov's sharp rocks he's like <laughs> he, he enjoyed that <laughs> yes I also <laughs> loved Loved uh, Oliva's deaths as well. Oh, like, they're so oh good. what's a leech? It's a slug. What do they not like? Salt. <laughs> oh, so do you know good. what, Al? I hope your favourite was salty popcorn and you couldn't eat it afterwards oh. because you're a disgusting fucker. <sighs> I loved. You know, you didn't, you didn't really see much of them because obviously the story is focusing on the women and their new world and what they're doing the to make positivity. it a better place. Yes. So you don't really see a whole lot of Al and Eva except for when they're just, you know, planning things and being disgusting. But I loved when Eva was there at the end and she unhinges her jaw and mosquitoes come out like, oh, that's like... Mwah. I love mm. that like horror creepy villainous woman look. Mosquitoes out. Oh, ugh. And then you she can hear it as well. The you bzzz. can. And then she flies up to the top of the cliff. And then they're like, oh, here's some citronella. Grow. And then she gets absorbed into the ground. Oh, so good. I worry about the ground. I think it won't. I don't, you know, when that happened, I was like, no, she kills plants. Dump her in the ground. Look, she wasn't. No, nah, she wasn't bleeding. It's her blood that does it. And you I know, know the earth is going to purify all that shit. I know, which is the, the you know the saving grace. But honestly, I was like, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh. for for a hot second, I was very worried. There was something that gave me a hot second worry too. Mm -hmm. Um, I got a mm. little worried traveling back in time just a little bit when. Mercury throws Chad off the cliff. Onto Chekhov's sharp rocks, yes. Yes. I thought, oh no. You know, they throw him off, and then the group from Timberline arrives, and they see his body, and they're like, what are you going to do with it? And they're like, nothing right now. And then they never come back to it, which obviously they get rid of it, whatever. But they don't come back to it in the story. It's not mentioned mm -hmm. again. And so I thought, oh my God, is he going to come back? But then I thought, nah, there's not any mist around there. It's fine. They're going to be safe. But then they mention that when Imani and everybody was taking the kids up to the clifftop, they couldn't because there was green mist there. So then again, I thought, oh, no, nah, is Chad going to come back? I think by then Chad's body would have gone. It would have been taken down from the rocks because it's not like he was thrown down timberline came the attack happened it wasn't bung bum 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 boom i know and no i'm sorry chad chad the thing is al is evil al has a vicious streak al yes. has this posing pretend fake misogynistic oh, yeah. um alpha male dominance bullshit going on feeding yeah. his veins and eva's like this badass bitch and i don't mean that in a complimentary way. right um you know she's a horrible slithering monster as well yeah they've got this they've got the villainous x factor yeah chad is a fucking dick yeah he is chad is a chad yeah who can shut the fuck up 
Yeah, you can. And then fuck off. Yeah. But I just thought, like, I, I just, I liked the way it was written. Because PC is really good at leaving little bits left behind in case she wants to pick something up again later. Yeah. But it's also completely satisfying at the end in case she doesn't. Yeah, we, we Chad is dead and we don't need to revisit that yeah. scumbag at all. I don't want him to come back and he's probably not gonna, but just the idea. Yeah, no, I'm glad it's not. I, uh, I, I don't think PC would write a character like Chad would be coming back to an abuser to to terrorize his victim further yeah i don't think that you would do that either no not when you've got alan eva in that that big moment to happen do you know what's something that i really like that is not about chad or al or eva tell me that ford is the green man which if (laughs) everyone will go back to the interview we did with pc with into the mist i was like he's the green man isn't he and she was like "Mm." (laughs) and he is and he's amazing i love bird i do as well and i found his description to be delightful and at one point hilarious the way he's wearing jeans oh my god i loved it when he was wearing jeans <laughs> like the cut, cut like cut off short jeans i'm like oh my god he's wearing jorts he is he is <laughs> i love it oh and I I just... can, you can understand mercury's hesitancy to you know have physical intimacies with a, a satyr like huh eh, it's a new world yeah but i do like that she doesn't, you know, just jump on him immediately. And she stops to think about it. Like, what if I don't like it? What if I do like it? <laughs> what if it's weird? What if it's weird and I what like it? What if it's weird? <laughs> what if it's not weird and I want it to be weird? He could probably make it weird if if she told him she wanted it weird. I mean, to be fair, he's got horns, hooves, and you know, fur. Does he have a tail? It, it's... Oh my God, I hope so. He has to. <laughs> he has tail. to have one of those, those tiny little cute <laughs> tail. And every time he gets really like overly excited, wink, it just starts going crazy. <laughs> like, a, you know, like a dog's tail starts to wag. Except his little sea tail. <laughs> Excuse me. This is the green man. We should have more respect we for him. We need to have more respect for the green man. We really, really do. This is waggling Santa tail. <laughs> oh, that is that is made my night. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Oh, oh, that's hilarious. Me too. Yes, I am glad that Ford came back properly, and it wasn't just a dream, or you know that he he was physically there. Yes, and he was able to help them in the background. Yeah, um, I was frustrated with Gemma. A lot in this episode, in this episode, this this book, this installment, because you know she she starts off in into the mist as a teenager, mm-hmm. but she's had to mature because her mother's not present. Yeah, her mother was terrible. Her mother was terrible. Her mother was there but not there. Um, and they, you know, she's watching Imani and Mercury and, I mean, to an extent, Karen as well, because Karen's had a lot of growth as well. And, mm-hmm. you know, she's she's watched all of these amazing ladies and Stella as well, not forgetting Stella. And um, she's learning from them and she's becoming one of them. But she was so freaking a teenager in this one, I suppose. Yes. And I kept having to remind myself she's only 16. And yes, she has an, an old soul, a mature spirit. Yeah. But at the same time, she's 16 with 16 hormones and she's met somebody who's close to her age. And yeah, he's a prick. But yeah, I was like, Gemma, calm yourself down. And when she finally was like, eh, I was so relieved. Yeah. It made me so mad when Chad was like, are you embarrassed to read books doing voices? And she's like, no. It's like a lot of fun. What's wrong with you? He probably doesn't even know how to read. 
Shut chat. Which, I mean, not to disparage anybody who can't read. There are reasons for that. But he's like one of these, he's actively, he learned to read as a child, but then actively fought to forget how to read. Because unless it's like, he's the kind of guy who probably wears his jeans, like that fall down. So all you can see are his, you know, Calvin Klein, skinny Mark boxer shorts. Yes. Flashing the back. Yeah, probably. Ugh, shut up, Chad. He's pro. He probably um, appropri- appropriates other people's cultures as well oh, and tries to make does. it part of his identity. Oh, he's gross. Because he's such a prick. But he's dead. Don't yeah. Stop. Should we stop talking about Chad? I mean, it's fun Chad. to bash him, but still. Yeah, stop it. Ugh. I'd love to see the garden, though. I would love to see oh, their garden. Oh, I know. And their and I know. I'd love to see what their adobe houses look like once they're built. Yeah. You know, flash forward five years and see. It's going to be like a whole city. It's going to be amazing. Uh They'll have to go on another clifftop. They will. Or they'll just have to ask the earth to, like, expand their cliff. (laughs) Do you need planning permission to put in an extra hill? I don't think so. No? I don't think so. That's good. You don't have to go through all that red tape. Mm -mm. No, there isn't any more red tape because it's the apocalypse. That's true. Do you think the mist will ever go? I don't know. I have a lot of questions about the mist, but also, yeah. like, you know, we were just plopped down, like, essentially into the middle of this story. Like, yes, the bombs. Into the mist. <laughs> the bombs happen in book one, but, like, you don't know anything about them. No. Nope. Because, you know, the world ends and you don't know where the mist came from, what the mist is, what. You know, like who's responsible for it you don't know any of that and so i just like i wonder i wonder if pc knows that i you know this is the beauty of it it doesn't even having matter the apocalypse, exactly having the apocalypse happen so soon like you know chapter one apocalypse yeah um you don't have the ability to communicate internationally or see news because people are dead or it just the technology's yeah. not there anymore yeah. so you're free not to think well this is the people who are responsible this is the reasoning why you don't need it and to be fair the the world is such a crap show that any of and you can name half a dozen countries who would do something yeah. crappy like this yeah including our own yeah so i like that open-endedness but that's something oh, that too. we appreciate yeah. We don't have all of the answers and we don't need all of the answers. No, that's like and one of this... our favourite things. Exactly, exactly. So we can speculate to the to the goats finally come. But we're not gonna get answers. And I don't think we'll get answers off PC if I'm I don't think we will. Honest, because she doesn't need to have the answers. And again, PC appreciates the openness of yeah. being able to tell your own story from that point on. Yeah. And you know what? I would love for like fan fiction to write their own installments in this you know it could you know perspectives of somebody from the timberline coming to the 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 the, the cliff yeah or you know martina's story yeah or you know somebody in five years time finally finding a home with these yeah. guys or you know what so- about the entire well, rest of the world well exactly you know exactly you've got the entire rest of the world it could be that not all of the world is even infected with the greenness i know i was thinking that and then i started thinking about m night Shyamalan. yes <laughs> yeah like oh it's just this it's just this little corner and they're fine and they've decided just to leave them to their own devices yeah they are, and they are the experiment it could be it could be it could be it could who be. knows who knows and i would be very surprised if pc cast wrote any more in this universe. oh i can't imagine she would do it either i would love it but it's not i don't think it's gonna happen no i think if if we got anything else it would be a novella because you know she's good at those too yes so and i would be quite i would enjoy that yeah so but really it's pc cast so you just have to enjoy everything well, exactly. Yeah, I, do. I have really enjoyed this. Yes. And the audiobook was so well performed. Yes. Yes. 
I agree. PC with that. knows how to write characters who you absolutely hate. Oh my god, she's so good at it. And she knows how to write a strong female character and yeah. she knows how to write a found friendship. Yeah. Which is one of our favourite tropes. Yes. So yeah, I really do enjoy it. I enjoyed her inclusion of the magic and the paganism in this mm-hmm. probably the most in all of the series that we've read with PC because mm-hmm. they are included. It's obviously, you know, um, yeah. part of her own life. But I really enjoyed the natural integration in, out of all of the books. I think this duology mm-hmm. really showcases it really nicely. Yeah. And it actually puts it in a context where like the Karens of the world can understand it and appreciate it yes. Um, yes. because it's adults as well it probably helps out it's adults yeah and they're able to express it in the correct ways rather than it being yeah. too emotional yeah it's an emotional thing obviously it's an emotional connection but they're able to put it into the correct context that others can understand yeah so I really do enjoy that yeah me too um, who's your favorite character in this one? Well, I mean, the Khaleesi and Badger, both good doggos. Got to give my shout out to those. Uh huh. And Dandy. Um. Yes. Marcus, I really enjoyed Marcus. Yes, I like. Marcus. I enjoyed the way that Marcus was trying to look after Gemma mm-hmm. and trying to help Chad grow up. It was the last cause. Yeah. Um. But probably, I'm going to pick core four. Yeah. Um, you know, the we don't usually go for the main characters, but no. I am going to in this instance and say, yeah. yeah it was Same. Nice. But me, I'm narrowing it down a little bit more. I, um, I mean, you have to love Mercury. But because because Mercury is the main character I also really loved Imani in this mm. one. Imani had some amazing powers and some amazing growth. And like at the end of the last one, you know, you kind of just you kind of wonder like, what did Imani get from the mist? And then she has that prophecy. And it's like the last lines of book one, and you're very shocked by it. I mean, like, how's that? Like, that's very similar to what Stella can do kind of so Mm -hmm. how is this what what is this going to mean and now she's going inside trees she needed more exposure she did and I'm glad that we found out that multiple exposures is not necessarily a bad thing it depends on depends on who you are on the inside core being yeah Mm -hmm. does that make you worry about your own exposure I mean, if we're being truthful, I'd probably have mosquitoes on the inside. I'm not taking leeches. <laughs> I'd probably probably be full of books. No, not really. Just because I want to be a villain and I like villains and stories. We're actually good people, Claire. We're not going to be full of bugs. That's okay. Don't Were you surprised by anything? That no, you're not full of bugs. That you're not currently full of bugs. Thank God. <laughs> um, um the character who left from Timberline. Keith. Keith. He dies within like ten minutes. <laughs> I know. Fuck that guy. <laughs> what an idiot. I mean, he was a misogynistic asshat, and the reason he left is because he couldn't stand women being in charge it was awful what a dick it was awful oh especially when they're giving him supplies which they're giving him supplies yeah food water medicines weapons yeah a full (laughs) tank of gas yes yeah and then uh they're like giving him the gun like do you know how to use this and he's like yeah and she's like no, seriously. Do you know how to use this gun? Yes, I'm a hunter. Like, fuck off. Never shot anything in his life. Fuck off, Keith. Ugh. A BB gun in your grandpa's backyard 
but a potato gun when you're a kid shooting at cans does not make you a hunter. No. Shut up, Keith. And I'm glad he melted. Shut up, Keith. Call me melted, Keith. Can I tell yeah. you what, what I was surprised by? <laughs> You're laughing, so it's going to be fun. What? <laughs> the Ford wore pants that one time. <laughs> <laughs> the jorts. He's got his jorts on. See it, the jorts. Oh, my god! Like, where do you find them? Because they, they couldn't have been his own pants that he was wearing no. prior. Because they he's described as being, you know, much larger than he was before the mist. I have questions. I do. One of them is, where do you get them? And the other one is, how do you get them on? I mean, he's got hooves. So, you know, are they like, are they skinny jeans? Exactly. Are the flares? <laughs> Has he ha- I mean, are they elasticated waistbands so they can get over his little, his his little, little tail? With his little tail. <laughs> set the, Ford, set the tail free and let it <laughs> flap out the back so we can, you know, tell when you're happy. I just really, really loved that he was wearing pants. <laughs> I don't know why it's stupid, but I love that he was I laughed. Pants. I honestly, <laughs> it wasn't like a, a lol moment, but I did. Oh. Like, oh, I have so I, many questions. Yeah. I also, um, I'm, I'm a little bit shocked that everyone so like easily accepted him. I know, but at the same time, we don't know what the Timberline people have gone through to get from Timberline to yeah. the the new home. Yeah. And plus the mist and plus all the powers. It gets to a point where you're just like, yeah, it's fine. Shrug. Sure. Shrug. Yeah, it's fine. That guy's yeah. got hooves and horns and a little satyr goat tail and he's yeah. wearing jorts. <laughs> That's fine. Fine. I'm going to go and put my magic blood in the soil and make this tomato plant grow. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I wonder if any other men, if they were dying, if something bad happened to them and they were dying and they took them to the mist, if they would also revive. Oh, that's a good question. I and think also, it depends like, on the spirit. But like the rest of the guys at Tim, um, that were at Timberline and are now with our core four, I mean, they all seem to be very good humans. So, I wonder if they would have any any abilities. No, and then I also, think... like, what about the other women who weren't exposed? Do they do they test it out? Is Doc Hillary doing science experiments? With consent. I think I think the other women, because we know that the women would be quote unquote safe, it would be do you want to step in the mist and see if something happens? Yeah. Um but with the men, um after the die, I mean hopefully you've got to wait a while for that. It depends, I suppose, how and why they've died. Um I can understand in the fight that Ford and fucking Al Rutland had Mm -hmm. and their spirit of vengeance and one of love um, kind of fought against death so that love intermingled with the mist and also nature's wants and needs at the moment I don't see any reason why but it's an open ended story anything could happen yeah but Marcus lives a healthy old age and when he does pass away he's surrounded by his family and he dies peacefully in his sleep because he's a big teddy bear of a man who I can only imagine gives the best hugs. Yeah. So, I think... Should we do some Would You Rather? I think we should do Would You Rather. Pew, 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 pew. We asked on social media, would you rather control a clue of leeches or a cloud of mosquitoes? And we all cheer for plural now, plurals. I know. I was so happy. <laughs> it's not even in the book, but I was like, what is what is the group of leeches called? 
clue. What is collective noun? Is that? noun of leeches? A clue. I love it's collective nouns. On. F- <laughs> it's just some of them are just the oddest things. They're amazing. Yeah. On Facebook, sixty-six percent said mosquitoes. On Instagram, fifty-six said leeches, and on TikTok, seventy-nine percent said mosquitoes. And we have some comments. We do. Emily on Facebook said, "I choose a cloud of mosquitoes because those insects can really bite, so they can be useful as long as I train them properly to do my bidding." <laughs> Bree on Facebook says, Mosquitoes, more mobile with more diseases they carry. Fly, my pretties, fly, fly. Can can I just say thank you to Emily and Bree for giving us those dramatic points? It was really good. Coral on Facebook said, They both suck blood, but mosquitoes can fly and swarm faster than leeches. Plus, they're more annoying. That's true. Colin on Facebook says, I'm going to go with leeches. The psychological trauma caused by being covered with a whole mess of leeches can't be overstated. I mean, don't get me wrong. You don't want to be covered with mosquitoes either. But those slimy little suckers, no thank you, nurse. I like nurse. No thank you, nurse. (laughs) (laughs) Gross. I was thinking about it. Constance on Facebook said, I feel like mosquitoes have a higher travel range and less maintenance overall. So let's go with my buggy vampires. All vampires all the time. All vampires all the time. Candy on Facebook says, imagine waking up in the middle of the night and you are covered in leeches. Nothing worse. Just the thought makes me die inside. The leeches would have to be sneak attacks. <laughs> and Glim Glam Gem on Instagram said, I will command a clue of leeches because it just sounds cooler. Besides, leeches are at least 20% cooler than mosquitoes. <laughs> this sounds like Glim Glam Gem has been doing some surveys. It does. It does sound like that. She's been doing some science and also some science. math. Wow. Statistics is hard. I know. Okay. What are you doing? I hate both of these. Yeah, it's disgusting. I think I have more context for leeches, though, because I've actually seen leeches, whereas Ugh. mosquitoes are like, you know, it's not really a UK based insect. Ugh. Are you picking leeches? I don't. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking. Eva's mosquitoes are inside of her, which is gross. Oh, fucking Rutland's leeches are on his person, which is. I'm going to go with leeches and I'm going to affect like a villainous persona of like a plague doctor I'm going to go full comic book supervillain so I can command the leeches in like a medieval style Mm -hmm. plague doctor Mm -hmm. but like you know, a modern hot one, you know, yeah. who's got tits. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course. Because I'm going to go for the silent but deadly. Mm-hmm. And the idea of waking up covered in the leeches, like Candy said, horrible. Yeah. That's horrific. But yeah. also, I like the way, I like the way, um, I appreciate, I don't know. Kudos? No, this is wrong. I can't find uh, the right no, word. There are no. Mm-hmm. I acknowledge no I acknowledge the way that Al fucking Rutland hid the leeches in the river waiting for the teachers where it got another animal instead. Yeah. You I feel like you could do those silent attacks a yeah. bit easier with it with it. Yeah. So my supervillain persona is going to be a plague doctor with leeches. Okay. I'm fine with but that. I'm not having them on my person because that's just wrong. It's just nasty. I'm going to be able to command them to come to me, not live on me, because that's I just think, nasty. I think what you should do in your persona is wear them like a cloak. Yes, I'll do that. I'm going to have a, a living, really creepy, sucky, leechy cloak. Yes. And I'm going to have a, a, a lab with loads of them in jars, different mm-hmm. jars and stuff. And then and the feeding on things. Yes, and My then 
You're going to unleash them. And then I'm going to unleash them. <laughs> unleash my pigeons. It's this is very um <laughs> What is that Ben Stiller movie called where they're all superheroes with the baller and Mystery Men. Mystery Men. Yes. Um I feel like the unleacher. Yep. That's you. Dr. Unleech. Dr. Unleech. Dr. Leech. I mean, I liked Unleecher. I th- I've got... I'm going to be in that universe because I need to do it for the lols. I need to go to... Um, oh, Casanova, Frankenstein's... Yes. Parties. Yes. And that, that, that's Wearing where Wearing your I'm leech cloak. Me. Wearing my leech and cloak. And you're playing so. Dr. Mask. I'm a plague Doctor Mask. That so this is my universe where yeah. I will be the super villain. I think that's fantastically terrible. I've just developed an entire thing. You okay, have your turn. Your turn. I don't have any of that. Well, you gotta. I, I I I've literally done it spur of the moment. Come on. I know. I know. Um. Yeah. Okay. Well, as we discussed earlier, I loved when. Eva unhinged her jaw and mosquitoes came out. So clearly that's what I'm going to do. I also really appreciate that from Strange the Dreamer, Lainey Taylor, having, like, you know, the moths. That character, Sarai, she had moths on the inside and, you know, just let them out. I don't know. I just think that's fun and creepy and very evil. And if I was going to be a villain, which obviously I would be, um, I think that's a fantastic power. But I like I'm not a fan of the mosquitoes and biting because they're itchy. It's itchy. Mm. It's very itchy. Um, so I don't like that. And I feel is like is that not worse than actually having them suck your blood? You know, you just get one mosquito bite in a really uncomfortable place and you just can't stop itching at it. Is that yeah. not the ultimate evil? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's what I was gonna say. Like, I I don't think that I would be using your words that you just said, an ultimate evil, I would be like an annoying evil. I would just be pestering. I would be the pest. <gasps> well, there's your supervillain name, the pest. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll be the pest. And uh, the, 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 the pest with the best. You've got a catchphrase. So do you. I will unleash you. <laughs> It's just terrible. Now, am I the am I the unleecher or Doctor Leech? I can't remember. I prefer the unleecher. That sounds more mystery man. You know, because the shoveler. True, true, and the ball at all the. Are you coming to the Casanova Frankenstein's party as well? Yeah, but of you course. can like burst through the door, like the mosquitoes, or burst the doors open for you, uh-huh. and you are carried on. Mm-hmm. A cloud of mosquitoes. Yeah, I into won't it. walk anywhere anymore. No, no, no. And you've got like thigh high stiletto boots on, of and then you I just do. kind of do some kind of like you know, um, seventy style dancing as you yes. come through. Yes. Do you know, know I almost. I'm sad. I'm sad. Can I just tell you, I'm sad that you are wearing the plague doctor mask because that's very silhouette of a mosquito. Which makes it even better that it doesn't actually match what you're doing. That makes your whole mystery men thing like a thousand times better. You know, it's like the blue Raja. That's true, but because your all he did eye was makeup throw is designed after mosquito wings. Yes, of course. Yes. And I will myself wear wings. They don't yes. work. No, but you have the wing cloak. Yes. But which, my... as the mosquitoes will carry you around, will help flutter and make it seem as if yes. you are yourself lying. I actually prefer to have my mosquitoes carry me very close to the ground as if I'm floating on a red carpet made of mosquitoes. Yes. It, it's logical. <laughs> Next I'm question? I'm everything about this. God, I wish I wish I could do fan art of this. You know who can do fan art? That's true. Superfan Brie. Come on, Superfan Brie. Can you please draw 
this the for pest us. and the unleacher yes <laughs> let's move on to the next question before we come up with an entire comic uh-huh and then we end up having to like get in touch with a publisher and be like please do this i mean we could do that anyway i mean we could do that anyway would you rather Claire <laughs> turn into a salmon or an eagle oh, neither I want to be the unleacher um, oh, I love to eat salmon so I'm going to turn to the eagle so I can eat the salmon okay um, <laughs> but also because I remember the conversation that we had about um, eagle sounds and I how know. eagles oh sound gosh. really dumb and do you know what? That was, I forgot, I completely forgot that that was included in this book. And they talk about that. And they're like, you know, that's not actually what an eagle sounds like. Like, because was they driving. don't know. Because they don't, don't know. know what that sound is. I was driving when that bit happened. And I was just pulling onto a, 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 I was on the, the motorway. And I was just pulling off it and I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> I had completely forgotten about that because, like, I listened to this. Of course I did as soon as the book came out. But uh, I had forgotten that that happened. And then we had that conversation separately in, like, six or seven other episodes. And then it happens again. Yes. So I, good. I, I, cut to Claire in the car laughing her head off doing bad choking eagle noises. What's <laughs> <laughs> the journey? the journey all. Oh, next question. I didn't even answer that one. Oh, I thought you did. I thought you picked eagle as well for same reasons. I mean, you probably that I should. Laugh and yeah, joking, cry thing. Yeah, probably <laughs> I should. <laughs> yeah, that's what I wanted. That that would be great. Just just for the sound effects. It's all I want in this world. Please insert sound effects here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <clears throat> would you rather have Gemma's healing ability or Doc Hillary's I know I'm going to pick Doc Hillary's the I think idea I'm going to pick hers as well yeah the idea of picking being able to help people and their mental health you know having a lot of very close family members and friends who are affected mm -hmm. by mental health if I could just help them, I would mean the world to me. Yeah. And she can also heal physically as well, just but More just a little bit. Yeah. Like she she can soothe your physical wounds as well, but she's better with mental health and I I I just think that's better. Although I do appreciate Gemma's evolution. Yes. And how at the end she doesn't even have to, she doesn't have to, ex like, use any of her physical, like, or her energy. She can just bleed on you. I wonder how much she could, like, bleed in a, like, a big bucket of water and how long it would still be potent. Yeah. Would it degrade? Does it keep retain it? Yeah, I don't know. If it if it retains, imagine what the path down the river looks like, because that's where she discovered she had that ability was when she was in the water. Yeah. And she saw a log or whatever regenerate. Like, what's happening on down the river then? Well, once a month it gets a boost. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> But then you have to think, does that actually count? Is Does that count? Does it have to be living blood? That was the sure. whole thing with, like, Twilight and why menstruation in Twilight wasn't bad because it wasn't living blood or something. Well, we're yeah. never going to get that answer, are we? Because we're not. it's a duology. We're not. You, you can just imagine she's, like, cut her finger, you know, just tie this like a paper cut or something. She's like, ah, damn. She goes and has a bath and suddenly the entirety of the hillside's healed. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, it's perfect. Well, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Would you rather... This is going to be a difficult one to answer. 
because I know that we're going to want to do all of them. And there are three options this time. No! I know. At least with two, we can split it. Yeah. Not this time. Would you rather toss Chad off a cliff, Citronella Eva, or salt Al fucking Rutland? Um, yeah, I want to do all of them. Yeah, all of them. Right, I'm going to... I'm going to toss... I'm going to sparta Chad off that cliff. Mm -hmm. And as he falls down, because he was picking flowers at the time, he was picking citronella flowers, he falls off the cliff dramatically. Mm -hmm. And in slow motion, you see the citronella flowers fall out of his hand and land in Eva's open gob. (laughs) Okay. And then, as he lands on Chekhov's sharp rocks, next to the bucket of salt, that goes tipping down the mountainside onto Al fucking Rutland, who is salted like the giant slug he is. Excellent. (sighs) I don't know. This is difficult. All of them. I want to do all of them because they all deserve them for very different reasons. But I have a feeling that Al fucking Rutland has got some of the similar traits that Chad has. Chad would go down Rutland's route. Yeah. (sighs) If Al would have just, like, gotten, gotten over himself and left them alone, you know, you and Eva... You can stay in Madras and don't bother us. Then the answer is toss Chad off a cliff. Because I feel like if Eva, if Al and Eva hadn't gotten together, Eva would still be doing her shit in Madras, which is not great. No. However, she has learned to stop slaughtering people and to, you know, milk milk them, milk them for their blood. I'm so, sorry, but not for one second when she was like, oh, you're going to get moved to these snug little houses next to the garden. I'm thinking, yeah, those snug little houses are a.k.a. the compost heap. Yes. <laughs> However, if they hadn't gotten together, I don't think she would have become as bad as she did. And then we create our beautiful sanctuary in the sky and everybody starts coming and so they just start sneaking away from madras and she can't do anything to stop them and so then she can just fizzle off and die all on her own if she hadn't gotten involved with al and if al had just been respectful and stayed dead then we could just kill chad yeah instead we have to kill all of them yeah don't at us for picking option D, E, and F. Yeah. Just kill them all. Just kill them all. Last question. The duology is complete. Which ability would you rather have? And you can choose any of them. Any of them. And you may pick having a say at the lower half so you can have the little tail. That's fine. I mean... If I get to pick any, and you're including Ford and his blue jeans, that's what I'm going to pick. Because he can transform into an eagle and a salmon and probably any other animal that he chooses to transform into. Plus he has horns? Like, yeah. That's what I pick. Do you think he transforms into the eagle? Like, scooches down so he's roughly got the shorts on and then transforms back into his sater self so the shorts actually fit onto his butt because i just i can't understand how he gets them on he's gonna have very thick thighs and Uh pulling that waistband over those thick thighs well i mean it's got it's got you know a button and a zip even then doesn't always happen what if they're breakaway? What if they're breakaway pants? They're oh breakaway blue God. jeans. He went to the Mitchell strip joint to get the breakaway pants. <laughs> he did. That's perfect. No notes. Happy with that right answer. 
Oh god, they're bejazzled. What, <laughs> what you never find out is that the on the back of the butt it says sweet. No, on the back of the butt it says the goat. <gasps> Greatest of all goat. time. He and he's like, nah, goat. nah, it's just me. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> I'm glad that he has bedazzled breakaway blue jeans. Bedazzled breakaway blue jeans. <laughs> you know when something's so funny you can't laugh? I'm like, <laughs> I'm in love with this concept. <laughs> I'm also trying to think how we can get these in the merch shop. I'm loving the imagery. Okay. Oh, we need Favorite ability. Photo? Sorry. We need. No, we need oh. to. We haven't answered this question. I did. Did I you? I am picking the bedazzled breakaway blue jeans. I'm picking Ford. I'm picking Ford's powers. Because you gave me permission to have Ford's powers. Okay. Now I've gone back to the blue jeans with goat bedazzled on the back. That's amazing. Um. I know. I'm sorry. I don't I really feel like I can answer this one because that was like the perfect There is answer. an option for leggings in the red bubble shop. So I'm going to have to make a pair of leggings with goat on the butt. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to okay. I'm going to pick Doc Hillary's just, you know, see above answer. I am. If you're going to have the bedazzled okay. butt, then I'm going to I'm going to heal everybody. There we go. <laughs> Yes. yes. The healing will be. Please check out this bizarre butt, yeah. and miraculously, everybody's like, "Ah." Okay. Favorite final thought quote. I was just going to give you a couple. You never fail to say the most interesting, heartless things. Oh. And I, I don't take this as an insult, but I thought of you about this line, not because I think you're heartless, but because it's like how you would want your villainous persona to be. Oh, yeah. So this is you as the pest. Thank you. Um you oh, I love this one. I love this one and it's from the this the the, the, the difficult trigger warning chapter. You're a yes. fucking survivor. That's a badge of honor and no damn body is going to make you feel less than that. Oh. And I was like, "Yes. Yes." I love how yes. they all came and just protected I loved Gemma instant judgment you committed yes. the crime you you pay yeah you got any others let's change the world oh that's so good i'm gonna i'm gonna leave the rest to you i'm gonna leave the rest okay. to you okay going back to chad you're going back down but you aren't taking the path and i won't need to untie your hands Fuck you, Chad. Fuck you, Chad. Shut up, Chad. I mean, is is there ever a name that has is it what's that phrase? Nominative, nominative determinism than Chad? Oh, it's so bad. Chad. Fuck you, Chad. Fuck you, Chad. <laughs> Trust him. He's not Satan. I give you my word. <laughs> He's not no, Satan. He's a Satan. What he's a Satan. He's a goat. He's the goat. He's the goat. Look at his little bejazzled jeans. <laughs> what was the old adage? That vengeance was best served cold? Al didn't believe that. He believed at any temperature, vengeance was tasty. <laughs> I fucking Thank hate Al fucking Rutland, but... <sighs> It's another one the pest has taken. Yeah. I loved their ritual scenes. 
Mm. I love air is my breath, fire my spirit, water is my blood, earth my body. And they just keep saying it over and over again and they're dancing and planting stuff. Just amazing. I also would like to say, remember, this is the apocalypse, not prom. I will plant these bushes with my prom dress on. I want to look pretty. I think I'll end with, there will always be more bad guys. But that just means we need to live loudly and joyfully to balance it. I will leave you with, there is no cat limit. I love that. Oh, Chad. Oh, you need another cat? How many cats do you need? Fuck you, Chad. Fuck you. Can that be a quote? Fuck you, Chad. Shut up, Chad. Fuck you, Chad. Shut up, Chad. (laughs) Definitely. If you liked this, try this. I found this on a list, and I can't remember what the list was, so... Bad me. Bad me. And it's called Any Sign of Life by Rhea Carson. It's a post-apocalyptic. Paige Miller is determined to take her basketball team to the state championship, maybe even beyond. But as March Madness heats up, Paige falls deathly ill. Days later, she wakes up attached to an IV and learns that the whole world has perished. Everyone she loves and all of her dreams for the future are gone. But Paige is a warrior. She pushes through her fear and her grief and gets through each day scrounging for food, for shelter, for safety. As she struggles with her new reality, Paige learns that the apocalypse did not happen by accident and that there are worse things than being alone. It felt like it had a lot of uh, potential themes that um, the the duologies had, Mm -hmm. um, but obviously centred on a more YA um, character. Yeah. And it, it sounds quite quite nice. It also reminded me a little bit of um, is it the loneliest girl in the universe? Oh yes, quite insular as well. So yeah. if you want to like just be very hyper focused on one particular character in their story, I think this one sounds in, like an interesting read for that. Yeah. What have you got? Mine that I also found on a list of apocalypse books. Probably BuzzFeed. I feel like that's when I get... Or a book list. I think mine might have been Epic Or Epic Reads, reads. As well. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. There's so there's so many. It might be Epic Reads. Um, this one is called Moths by Jane Hennigan. And I'm sorry that that's what the title of the book is because we all know how you feel about a moth. Do you know, I, I hate moths, but at the same time, I respect, like, moths. I love Mothman. Yeah. It's weird. I don't know what's going on. Actual oh. moths can fuck off. Sure. Mothman for life. Okay. Moths by Jane Hennigan. Forty years ago, the world changed. Toxic threads left behind by mutated moths infected every man and boy either killing them quietly in their sleep or turning them into crazed killers who attacked on impulse. No one was safe from their psychopathic wrath, and no one could help them. All seemed hopeless. But humanity, as it does, adapted and moved on. Now a matriarchal society reigns, and men are kept in specially treated, dust-free facilities for their safety, never able to return to the outside. Mary has settled herself into the new world, taking care of the male residents at her facility. But she is one of the few people who remembers what life was like before the change, and she is haunted daily by her memories of her family, of her joy, of him. Now the world is quiet again, but only because secrets are kept safe in whispers. And the biggest secret of all? No one wants to live inside a cage. (laughs) Do we have a new one to spy? We do, but it's not new. This one came out in May. Newish. Newish. 
It's called The Daedalus Protocol by Jeff Schechter. And it is also apocalyptic. A deadly pathogen has been unleashed across the globe, killing livestock and destroying crops as it spreads. A near extinction event from worldwide famine will be certain if it's not stopped in time. A mysterious man known only as Daedalus, possessing advanced technology and seemingly unlimited resources, has assembled a crew of notable soldiers and scientists for a mission to stop the coming plague. Embarking on a perilous archaeological odyssey, this elite team, led by SEAL Commander Griffin Oak, delves from the depths of ancient tombs to the heart of the Catholic Church in order to unearth a long-buried treasure required to save the world. Racing against time and a crazed zealot hell-bent on annihilation, they must find the location of the fabled Fountain of Youth to thwart the coming threat. I know I shocked you with the Fountain of Youth, throwing that in there. I had I, I had like sudden like Indiana Jones feels I know, you know where it I turns know, like yes. it seems fairly innocuous but ta da big thing actually yeah 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 I, yeah, like I felt the same yeah. thing when I was Good. reading the summary like yes <laughs> I like it I like it that sounds it sounds like an absolute like adventure yeah cool, cool. okay I like it that's it for this episode of fictional hangover I'm Amanda and I'm Claire. Join us next time as we discuss Burn the Negative by Josh Winning. With Josh Winning. Look out for our Would You Rather polls on social media. Don't forget about our book club and monthly challenges on Facebook. Be sure to visit our shop on Redbubble at fictionalhangover.redbubble.com for all your favorite fictional hangover themed merchandise, including goat leggings. <laughs> And become a patron of ours on Patreon at patreon.com slash fictional hangover. Until next time, remember, the only cure for a fictional hangover is another book. You can find us at fictionalhangover.com. Follow us on Instagram, threads, TikTok, and YouTube at Fictional Hangover. And find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fictional hangover. If you like this episode, check out our others and be sure to rate, review, and subscribe so you don't miss out. And finally, special thanks to Liz Emerson for our music. You can find her on Facebook and Patreon. Thanks for listening. <laughs>